Hello, welcome to Truth Not Tradition online Bible study for November 2nd, 2016. I'm Tony Samario, coming to you from brosal.org YouTube channel. And I want to get back and finish the book of Enoch. Uh, we left off a few weeks ago with Enoch uh, recounting the two visions that he had that seemed to be well, you'll see when we start here how important all this is to him, what he's about to tell them. And I think we'll also see in here that it's quite possible to imagine that there was once uh, more explanation from the way that he presents the uh, the things that he's going to reveal, that we have part of that. But he does say two visions, and we appear to have both of them. We went through the vision of the animals a few weeks ago, and now uh, what's called the prophecy of the ten weeks. So let's get right to the book of Enoch and the prophecy of the ten weeks. And someone asked a few weeks back that there was a, a book called the book of Enoch, and a book of Enoch 2. And uh, were they the same book? And no, they're not the same book. We're reading from the Ethiopian book of Enoch. And this is the one that has the credibility, as far as I can tell, from the little bit I've read. This is the one that comes from the area that the Jews went when they left with the Ark of the Covenant, when the prophets told them that that the fall of Jerusalem was imminent and God was going to send the Babylonians to get him. Some of them listened and took off and headed for Ethiopia. And, and this is where the Ethiopian book of Enoch, uh, it comes from Ethiopia and supposedly we can imagine it, uh, it was taken there by the Jews because it's always been part of their sacred writings, if this is in fact genuine. So, the prophecy of the ten weeks. And now, my son Methuselah, call to me all your brothers, gather to me all the children of your mother, for a voice calls to me, and a spirit has been poured over me, so that I may show you everything that will come upon you forever. And after this, Methuselah went and called his brothers to him and gathered his relations. And he spoke about righteousness to all his sons and said, Hear, my children, all the words of your father and listen properly to the voice of my mouth. For I will testify and speak to you, my beloved. Love uprightness and walk in it and do not draw near to uprightness with a double heart. And do not associate with those of a double heart, but walk in uprightness, my children, and it will lead you in good paths, and righteousness will be your companion. For I know that the state of wrongdoing will continue on earth, and a great punishment will be carried out on the earth, and an end will be made of all iniquity. And it will be cut off at its roots, and its whole edifice will pass away. And iniquity will again be complete on the earth, and all the deeds of iniquity, and the deeds of wrong, and of wickedness will prevail for a second time. Written by Enoch the scribe, this complete wisdom and teaching praised by all men, and a judge of the whole earth for all my sons who dwell on earth and for the last generations who will practice justice and peace. So this is his uh, introduction here. And notice again the uncanny accuracy with what we call our scripture in that he's predicting that this this time of wrongdoing that's going to continue on the earth in his time 
will bring about a great punishment and an end will be made of all iniquity and it will be cut off at its roots and its whole edifice will pass away. Okay, this would be the flood, right? Uh, and iniquity will again be complete on, on earth and all the deeds of iniquity and the deeds of wrong and of wickedness will prevail for a second time. So, this appears to be our existence. So he goes on now after telling him that this is written by Enoch the scribe, this complete wisdom and teaching praised by all men and a judge of the whole earth. Let not your spirit be saddened by the times, for the Holy and Great One has appointed days for all things, and the righteous man will rise from sleep will rise and will walk in the path of righteousness and all his paths and his journeys will be an eternal goodness and mercy. He will show mercy to the righteous man and to him give eternal uprightness and to him give power. And he will live in goodness and righteousness and will walk in eternal light. And sin will be destroyed in darkness forever. And from that day will never be seen again. And after this, Enoch began to speak from the books. So there's one sign that, you know, if he's written books, do we have everything that was contained in all the books that he's speaking from? I mean, who else is, you know, what other books do we have than the books he's written at, at this point? Enoch the scribe. So these are the books that Enoch's written. So I say we probably don't have everything Enoch's written when he describes telling, telling his children everything that will ever happen. Complete wisdom, complete teaching. So I think that's one of the reasons it's not so easy to reconcile everything is that we don't have the complete teaching. We have the parts that have survived, and perhaps even stuff that's been changed and manipulated over time. But these prophecies and these, you know, as I've said from the beginning, the expectation through Enoch of the same sort of timetable that would come to us through the other scripture, and the centrality of the Son of Man, and all these kind of things. So, the prophecies demonstrate, just as he is here, you know, he's telling his children, wrongdoing will continue. Don't think because I've talked to the angels or whatever, everything's going to be fine. Remember what kind of world they're living in, these watchers and this, people are killing each other. They've introduced swords and, and war. And so he, te he assures them that wrongdoing will continue and then iniquity will be cut off from the root, but then it'll rise again. So yeah, then he goes on to tell him, don't, don't let your spirit be saddened by the times, which means that's his, it's good for us too. We're, we're just in the iniquity and all its same characteristics rising again. So don't let your spirit be saddened by the times for the holy and great one has appointed days for all things and the righteous man will rise from sleep. So there's that promise again. So after this, Enoch began to speak from the books, and Enoch said, Concerning the sons of righteousness, and concerning the chosen of the world, and concerning the plant of righteousness and uprightness, I will speak these things to you and make them known to you, my children. Now, it seems to me we're talking about three specific characteristics and, uh, and peoples here, not one thing. Uh, the sons of righteousness would be all those that whose deeds qualify them. Sheep and the goats, right? Sons of righteousness. Enter you righteous into my eternal rest. Isn't that what it says? Doesn't God call them righteous twice in that? So the sons of righteousness, and you're going to find out here maybe today or next week if we have to go 
any farther than today. No, we'll find out this week. It's in the first week, the characteristics of this first week, where we get righteousness from. But concerning the sons of righteousness, those are the people I believe judged by their works. Are you righteous? Do you, you know, do you carry that maliciousness in your heart to hurt others for your own gain? Or, you know, do you have any love in your heart? Do you perform any acts of love and selflessness? And concerning the chosen of the world, I think these are the the believers, like most of us tuning into this Bible study, believers that Jesus rose from the dead, that's the ones Paul, you know, was called to illuminate things for because it was such a crazy story. This Messiah that died came as a poor beggar, you know, a poor homeless man died and rose again. He's the one they've been waiting for the, that's going to rule the kingdom like King David and vanquish all their enemies forever. He can't be the Messiah. And the Greeks can't understand how a God becomes a man to die, to become, a, you know, to raise to be a man again instead of a God. Why does the God need to be a man? So, you know, it was foolishness to Gentiles and, and a stumbling block to Jews. So the chosen are just what Paul said chosen to hear this. You can't even want to hear it, Paul said in Romans. You, you know, it's not even something you can think, well, I, I'd like to believe that. You're not going to, unless God calls you to see this truth. These are the chosen of the world, I believe, not the Jews. They're spoken of now in this next line, and concerning the plant of righteousness and uprightness. You're going to find out in this prophecies of these weeks who this plant of righteousness and uprightness most likely is. I say it's what comes out of Moses and the law. Abraham, actually. I'm sorry, Abraham. It comes out of the following of <clears throat> the covenant with Abraham. They would be the plant of righteousness, right? That righteousness that was by faith. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So this is this plant. The chosen are the ones that were going to believe in this Redeemer that raised from the dead when no one else could believe in that. Okay, so anyway, that's what I think he's saying here. And Enoch said, concerning the sons of righteousness and concerning the chosen of the world and concerning the plant of righteousness and uprightness, I will speak these things to you and make them known to you, my children, I, Enoch, according to that which appeared to me in the heavenly vision, and that which I know from the words of the holy angels and understanding from the tablets of heaven. Those are the credentials he's given. Huh? What appeared to me in my heavenly visions, what I know from the words of the holy angels, and understanding from the tablets of heaven, whatever those are. And Enoch then began to speak from the books and said, I was born the seventh in the first week while justice and righteousness still lasted. Okay, now think of that. He's born outside the Garden of Eden, right? They're all born outside the Garden. So he's born the seventh, meaning the seventh from Adam, the seventh generation, which remember they're living thousands of years, so we're talking five, six thousand years after Adam. In the first week, while justice and righteousness still lasted. So see, nothing about a law, nothing about believers in Jesus, none of that mattered in the first week, while justice and righteousness so you need to remember that as we get toward the the final part of the of Enoch's book when he goes into what the what's coming to the sinners and what's coming to the righteous because a lot of it I think he's talking then into his present moment when the only judgment is this justice and righteousness and everything else you're either just 
and righteous, or you're not back then. So we certainly live under the second iniquity, but we're, you know, we're way down the cycle in the brainwashing when you find in these other parts that we read where he holds the the leaders, bring me the leaders who led, right? Remember the, the 70 leaders of the sheep? A few weeks ago, we read the last prophecy. Okay, so recall that it was the leaders that got cast into the lake of fire with the watchers, right? It wasn't all the people. And so I tend to feel that in this first week he's describing the only law, if you will, is sort of the nature of God, justice and righteousness. And if you haven't got that justice and righteousness in you, you've in that first week you've abandoned God. You've abandoned the way of God to follow after these watchers. And you know, destruction's gonna come upon that whole edifice. The whole thing's gonna be wiped out and then start again. So now we're in the start again, where rather than just justice and righteousness, we then get this plant of righteousness. Abraham is called out of the world to receive this, this story and this teaching about the way of God, because now it's been lost. It was taught to Adam, who taught it to his sons, and all the way through the generations of Enoch, it was known to those that were keeping the ways of justice and righteousness. But since that whole edifice was destroyed and this existence began again, we don't carry that justice and righteousness as a measure the way they did. Perhaps Noah was still under such, a, uh, such terms. But by the time we get now to Abraham, he's called out of the world and God declares Abraham believed God and his faith was credited to him as righteous. See, all of a sudden, it's not that Abraham was righteous. It's that Abraham believed God and that was credited to him as righteousness. Because remember, in this cycle, we're pretty much told there are no righteous, none. Nobody pleases God. There are no righteous left in this cycle. So we've had to have new provisions made for us. And that starts with the calling out of Abraham to, I, I suppose, to have an opportunity to start this, uh, this um, revealing of God and God's way to this world that is primarily wicked and does not exist under righteousness and justice any longer. So I, I think that that needs to be kept in mind because as we start talking about at the end of the 10 weeks and Enoch goes into the judgment sort of idea, all you sinners are going to get this and all you sinners are going to get that and only the righteous will prevail. You know, he may just be speaking about the time he's living in and warning all the people around him that, that know the difference because there is only one uh, judgment. You're either just and righteous or you're not. And if you're not, well, then you're part of these group of sinners in this first week that, that Enoch's dealing with. I'm not so sure we're in, under these same conditions now. We've, we've, God has provided all sorts of ways to cover our unrighteousness. And of course, Jesus the Christ is the is the high priest, the ultimate covering that can that covers every every sin, everybody's iniquity, so that through that door it can be offered to anyone. Anyone can be redeemed through Jesus. So okay, so after this first week, when Enoch's born, and justice and righteousness still lasted, and, and after me, in the second week great injustice will arise and deceit will have sprung up and in it there will be the first end and in it a man will be saved and after it is ended iniquity will grow and he will make a law for the sinners 
So, of course, this is Noah. The first end and the man that saved is Noah. And we're already shown that iniquity is going to grow and Noah would make a law for the sinners. And perhaps that's where, you know, perhaps there was a law that became the law of Moses after it had died out over thousands of years. But according to Enoch, the first end, a man will be saved and uh, iniquity will grow and he will make a law for the sinners. And after this in the third week, at its end, a man will be chosen as the plant of righteous judgment. And after him will come the plant of righteousness forever. Okay, so this third week now, this is the choosing of Abraham. And after this, in the fourth week, at its end, visions of the righteous and holy will be seen, and a law for all generations, and an enclosure will be made for them. So that sounds like Moses, right? Law for all generations and an enclosure, right? The, the original tabernacle in the wilderness. And after this, in the fifth week, at its end, a house of glory and sovereignty will be built forever. Right? This would be Solomon and the Solomon's temple. And after this, in the sixth week, all those who live in it will be blinded. This is this house of glory. And the hearts of them all, lacking wisdom, will sink into impiety. And in it, a man will ascend. And at the end, the house of sovereignty will be burnt with fire. And in it, the whole race of the chosen root will be scattered. So this brings us to the diaspora, right? After you know, Nenix pointing out here that in this sixth week, this house of glory that was built by Solomon, everybody who live in it will be blinded. The hearts of them all lacking wisdom will sink into impiety. I mean, this is where we get all these um, scriptures about this great whore when God divorces them and calls them a whore and tells them you're no longer my people and I won't be your God. You'll be known as not my people. So that's in this sixth week and by the end of it, it and in it a man will ascend. That must be the Christ, right? Jesus. And at its end, the house of sovereignty will be burnt with fire by the Romans. And in it, the whole race of the chosen root will be scattered. And after this, in the seventh week, an apostate generation will arise. And many will be its deeds, but all its deeds will be apostasy. Okay, that's us, Christians. <laughs> that's the, that's what the, the synagogue of Satan and the Zionist Christian Alliance, as far as I'm concerned, amounts to. And at its end, the chosen righteous from the eternal plant of righteousness will be chosen, to whom will be given sevenfold teaching concerning his whole creation. And when iniquity and sin and blasphemy and blasphemy and wrong and all kinds of evil deeds increase, and when apostasy, wickedness, and uncleanness increase, a great punishment will come from heaven upon all these, and the Holy Lord will come in anger and in wrath to execute judgment on the earth. And in those days, wrongdoing will be cut off at its roots, and the roots of iniquity, together with deceit, will be destroyed from under heaven. And all the idols of the nations will be given up, their towers will be burnt in fire, and they will remove them from the whole earth, and they will be thrown down into the judgment of fire and will be destroyed in anger in the severe judgment that is forever. And the righteous will rise from sleep and wisdom will rise and will be given to them. And after this, the roots of iniquity will be cut off and the sword will destroy the sinners. The blasphemers will be cut off in every place. Blasphemy will be destroyed by the sword. So quite a... a, a uh, Seventh week, huh? A little more detail here in this seventh week. So this is the one that we would appear to be living in. This is this 2,000-year time since the destruction of the temple. 
So let's go over that again. In the seventh week, an apostate generation will arise. Many will be its deeds, but all its deeds will be apostasy. So I, I can only see this as the the rise of this uh, this false the Zionistic Judaism, the, even the Kabbalah and all the modern talk of occult knowledge that all uh, claims to to stem from Solomon, from Moses, the Jewish writings properly interpreted allegorically is what this Kabbalah, the Jewish Kabbalah and the occult knowledge of the modern day is. So that's what it says to me. An apostate generation, many will be its deeds, right? Occult teaching, Kabbalah, the rise of, you know, the world banking systems, the the rise of all these, you know, the Roman Catholic Church and the, all, all of these deeds that come out of this apostate generation and all its deeds will be apostasy. See, nobody, nobody's following after God, truly, which is how the world got, you know, it couldn't be. If we were following after God, we'd have a, a, a world of peace and love just what Jesus said when he was here. If you just follow me, demonstrate to the world. You know, then then the, there's another possibility for this life. But as long as we're all selfish and, oh, ye of little faith, worrying about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, and we're supposed to be the believers. We're supposed to be the followers. So, um so anyway, I think this is what it means to me, the seventh generation of all its deeds being apostasy. We're all talk and no action. And at its end, the chosen righteous from the eternal plant of righteousness will be chosen to whom will be given sevenfold teaching concerning his whole creation. I'm wondering if that's not going to come through this revealing of the two witnesses and the 144,000 and and all those who, you know, the few the few that aren't going to fall for the deception that's coming. Uh, remember, this eternal plant of righteousness, it was taught by Paul that the true Israel is all those who believe in the Messiah. That's the true Israel, not the bloodline. So... I imagine that that's what this means, the chosen righteous from the eternal plant of righteousness, which includes both Jews and so-called Christians, all of those that are truly following God, truly following his way of selflessness and non-judgment, loving your neighbor. Um, because remember, these Jews that are against Zionism, they're going to see Jesus, obviously. They're the ones that are going to give their heads in the end. They're, they're the ones that are going to say, aha, here's the true Messiah. Remember, it was one of their rabbis who died a few years ago who said, I've seen the Messiah. He's coming soon. I know who it is. I'll write it down. And after I die, open the envelope in a year and find out. Well, he saw Jesus. So that just seems to lay the foundation for the fact that in this, this end time now, the Jews who are waiting for their Messiah are going to get a chance to be offered Jesus, just as they were 2,000 years ago. Most of them aren't going to choose Jesus, just like 2,000 years ago. The official state of Israel is obviously not going to choose Jesus. But the chosen righteous from the eternal plant of righteousness will be chosen. And I believe that's going to you know, Christians need to listen because just believing in Jesus is obviously not the criteria. Many will come in that day and say, did we not cast out demons and heal the sick in your name? And he will say, depart from me, evildoers. I never knew you. So these are obviously people who call themselves Christians. So just calling yourself a Christian Saying that you believe apparently isn't enough. And, and I can see why, because to know Jesus like he told those Pharisees at the time, 
You claim to follow Moses, but Moses taught about me. You claim to love God, but if you loved God, you'd love me. So you claim to be a Christian. You claim to follow Jesus, but if you really knew Jesus, you'd really follow him. You know, you wouldn't just claim to believe in him. You'd actually go through the pains of following him, which would mean to not claim your possessions as your own, not judge other people, love your neighbor, turn your other cheek, not be concerned with the cares of this world. The greatest among you believers will be your servant. So how many Christians we got rushing around to be each other's servant and the servant of their enemy and the servant of their neighbor? So I say that this is the whole idea here. Those will be revealed who have really followed this teaching, who have really believed like Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, Christians believe that Jesus was raised and it is credited to them as righteousness. I, I believe that. But when it talks about the chosen, the followers, the you know, the ones that are given the reward for following him. I'm not sure how that breaks down. You know, I, I believe I'm saved for believing. But, you know, beyond that, you know, what part of this chosen righteous? Am I part of the chosen righteous or just the saved who had righteous credited to me for my belief? I, you know, I, I know that there's a little bit of a a question there that can be argued on both sides. I just, I have to relate it to the fact that all the Christians of my life who believe, and I believe that they believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but they sure don't follow him. And they spend their entire life judging people. They spend their entire life, you know, running away from their neighbor, not loving their neighbor. And so they don't follow Jesus. They don't show the world Jesus. In fact, they profane the name of Jesus to the world. Uh, I don't know what how God will reconcile all of us that believe in Jesus but don't really follow him and show him to the world. So I, I'm not, that's why I, I hesitate to present every believer as this, you know, right, the righteous will live by faith. Yeah, but faith is action not belief. So again, I, I don't want to over confuse it, but I think every Christian should consider the fact that believing in Jesus also leaves you open to the charge. Many will come in that day and say, did we not cast out demons and do all sorts of things in your name? So, you know, the safest thing is to follow him. The safest thing is to love your neighbor. The safest thing is to you not claim possessions as your own. Turn the other cheek, right? Praise those that persecute you. And of course, if it's all done without love, we don't gain anything. So it's, a, you know, this is to me, when we talk about this sevenfold teaching, you know, this wisdom, you know, what is this wisdom? Could it possibly amount to nothing more than I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. That doesn't sound like wisdom. Paul said it's foolishness. God has to call you to believe that foolishness. So what is the wisdom of the whole creation? And so I say it's got something more to do with uh, having that spirit of God in you and performing the faith, the action of the, the world, somebody in the world, the out, someone outside of you is able to see God because God is in you. Uh, that's the only righteousness I can imagine. And the wisdom of the whole creation must be in revealing that to the whole creation. Revealing God in creation. Anyway, uh, when iniquity, but still in this seventh week now, after the chosen righteous and the eternal plant from the eternal plant of righteousness will be chosen to whom will be given sevenfold teaching concerning his whole creation. And when iniquity and sin and blasphemy and wrong 
and all kinds of evil deeds increase, and when apostasy, wickedness, and uncleanness increase, a great punishment will come from heaven. So in case you want to see what kind of world we live in, if we're thinking we're in the end times when this wrath of God is to come, I mean, look at what has to, look at the characteristics that Enoch sees when iniquity and sin and blasphemy and wrong and all kinds of evil deeds increase and when apostasy, wickedness and uncleanness increase. So this is what, you know, welcome to our world. A great punishment will come and the Holy Lord will come in anger and in wrath to execute judgment on the earth. So it sounds like this end times that we're expecting to end in the in the return of Jesus. And in those days, wrongdoing will be cut off at its roots, and the roots of iniquity, together with deceit, will be destroyed from under heaven. See, not destroyed for all time, never to be heard of again, as Enoch promised, that's coming at an, at, in another week to come. But in the seventh week, it will be destroyed from under heaven won't be part of our scene, right? Devil's going to be locked away in a pit for a thousand years. It's the way I'm seeing that. And all the idols of the nations will be given up. Their towers will be burnt in fire and they will remove them from the whole earth, right? Towers of Babel kind of thing. The whole, all these things that have been built to worship their other, their idols, the powers that they've built them to. And they will be thrown down into the judgment of fire. Which sounds like the towers to me, because no people have been mentioned. It says, and all the idols of the nations will be given up. Their towers, meaning the nations' towers, will be, give, will be burnt in fire, and they will remove them from the whole earth. And they will be thrown down into the judgment of fire, and will be destroyed in anger, and in the severe judgment that is forever. So it doesn't sound like people being destroyed, but these idols and towers, right? Ashtarapoles in the Old Testament sense. Those are what are going to be torn down and thrown into the judgment of fire and destroyed. And the righteous will rise from sleep and wisdom will rise and will be given to them. So here's the promise for us Christians about rising, huh? during this seventh week. And after this, the roots of iniquity will be cut off and the sword will destroy the sinners. The blasphemers will be cut off in every place. Blasphemy will be destroyed by the sword. So this is the, what I imagine is the promise of what comes after the thousand years. Uh, I'm unsure. Uh, Perhaps this next eighth week is what comes after the thousand years. Perhaps that seventh year ends with the millennial kingdom. And now it says after this, there will be another week, the eighth, that of righteousness and a sword will be given to it so that the righteous judgment may be executed on those who do wrong. And the sinners will be handed over into the hands of the righteous. So, is this eighth week at the beginning of the thousand-year millennium or at the end? And at its end, this eighth week, they will acquire houses because of their righteousness and a house will be built for the great king in glory forever. Right? That's at the end of this eighth week. Uh, it's a little confusing to me because that sounds a lot like the tabernacle or the, the temple that's going to be occupied for a thousand years and, and then on into, you know, forever because it won't cease to be occupied when the thousand years is ended and the devil is let out of the pit to tempt the nations again. And they come to surround Jerusalem and fire comes down to wipe them out. So, once this temple is set up in Jerusalem during the millennial kingdom, you know, it's, it's never gonna, it's never gonna be, uh, subjected to, to destruction again. And so I'm not so sure that this eighth week doesn't refer to everything 
after the the wrath of God, right? Uh, except that it's in the seventh week that the righteous rise from sleep. And so, yeah, I'm a little confused about that. Does the seventh week include the millennial kingdom? Do the righteous rise from sleep before the millennial kingdom? And then in the eighth week, the eighth, that of righteousness, and a sword will be given to it so that righteous judgment may be executed on those who do wrong. And the sinners will be handed over into the hands of the righteous. And at its end, end of this eighth week, they will acquire houses because of their righteousness. And a house will be built for the great king in glory. And after this in the ninth week, the righteous judgment will be revealed to the whole world. And all the deeds of the impious will vanish from the whole earth. And the, whole, and the world will be written down for destruction and all men will look to the path of uprightness. And after this, in the tenth week, in the seventh part, there will be an eternal judgment that will be executed on the watchers and the great eternal heaven that will spring from the midst of the angels. And the first heaven will vanish and pass away, and a new heaven will appear, and all the powers of heaven will shine forever with sevenfold light, and after this, there will be many weeks without number forever in goodness and in righteousness. And from then on, sin will never again be mentioned. And now I tell you, my children, and show you the paths of righteousness and the paths of wrongdoing. And I will show you again so that you may know what is to come. And now he's going to go in here into a long sort of sermon about sticking with righteousness and, and not and not uh, wrongdoing. But I want to talk a little bit more here. These last few weeks are a little bit confusing, but they they include all the things we're aware of. It's just I'm having a difficult time reconciling all of our expected events into the way it's written here. Pretty easy to see that this seventh week after the temple in Jerusalem's destroyed by the Romans and the people are scattered, then there would be the seventh week of iniquity and all our deeds would be iniquity. And this is going to lead to this judgment that's coming. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the righteous will rise from sleep. So this throws me off a little bit in the, in the timing, as we expect, from the seventh week. Uh, to the eighth week, because you know, rising from sleep is not mentioned again by Enoch. So as far as Enoch's concerned, the righteous rise in this seventh week. And then in the eighth week, the eighth is, is characterized as that of righteousness, where the seventh was characterized as, as that of apostasy. The eighth is characterized as that of righteousness, which is why I I can only imagine that it includes the millennial kingdom. Which would be to say that the righteous rise from sleep before the millennial kingdom at the end of the destruction of the uh, of this wrath of God that we expect, this three and a half year wrath of God, the end of that, the righteous will rise from sleep. Will it be only those that gave with their heads? I mean... Enoch's pretty general here, the righteous. So, and then the eighth week characterized by righteousness, a sword given it to execute judgment on all who do wrong. So it's not their own sword of iniquity to take life. It's a sword given to it to, you know, to honor righteousness, let's say. And at its end, they will require houses because of their righteousness. Houses would seem to me to mean authority, not homes like casas to live in, but houses of authority, I would imagine, is what that means. And a house will be built for the great king in glory 
forever. So, you know, that always struck me as this millennial kingdom time. So I admit to being a little confused as to trying to reconcile Enoch's eighth kingdom, seventh and eighth kingdom with what we're living through right now and expecting. We can only, and then the ninth, ninth week calls for a, the world to be written down for destruction. And all men will look to the path of uprightness. Now this is sort of a scene we're not aware of too much from our own scripture, are we? The righteous judgment will be revealed to the whole world in this ninth week, and all the deeds of the impious will vanish from the whole world, and the world will be written down for destruction, and all men will look to the path of uprightness. Now, we know, because here it only mentions a new heaven, but in Revelation it mentions a new heaven and a new earth. For the old passed away. So this ninth week would appear to be, you know, it, it, it's like Revelation covers that ground just in a summary, and we don't really get any details. Here in Enoch, perhaps we get some details that the whole world will be written down for destruction, and all men will look to the path of uprightness. So again, this is all before this white throne judgment. Because in the tenth week, in the seventh part, there will be an eternal judgment that will be executed on the watchers and the great eternal heaven that will spring from the midst of the angels. And the first heaven will vanish and pass away. And a new heaven will appear. And all the powers of heaven will shine forever with sevenfold light. And after this, there will be many weeks without number forever in goodness and righteousness. And from then on, sin will never again be mentioned. So, you know, I, I just, I like to point out how, A, it, you know, the, the Enoch strikes me as being so valid and, and relevant because of this understanding of the timing of it all. The fact that it's slightly different from what we're used to speaks to me that, you know, the reality that, that we have lost our, you know, any clear picture of all this. We're, we're obviously not meant to, to have a clear picture of what happens after this, this week that we're in, because it probably doesn't serve us to know all the details. But Enoch sees this future and just like the rest of the scripture we know, somewhere out the other end is some sort of righteousness forever and sin is never mentioned again. So when I reflect back on, you know, this whole creation and God doing something, you know, what is God doing that required allowing the serpent to tempt Adam and Eve allowing Adam and Eve to fall, allowing the watchers to fall, allowing mankind to follow these paths of wickedness and injustice and iniquity, only to create it, create it all new again and never even a mention of this, all of what, what is to us existence, a world of sin. All have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. None please God. No, not one. All our righteousness is a filthy rags. You know, that's that's pretty clear. It's repeated, and even in, in Enoch's vision of the seventh week here, doesn't sound so good. Apostate generation. Many deeds, all its deeds will be apostasy. Iniquity, sin, blasphemy, wrong, all kinds of evil deeds increase. You know, that's us. That's the the existence we live in. So, you know, I would like to suggest that all of it is, you know, clearly to a purpose. There's, God must have a purpose if there is such a God creating all this. Then why does God need to create a sinful opportunity if what we see 
by all of the scripture is that the intention is simply to recreate it all new again. And no more sin, no more death, no more suffering. You know, why not create it that way from the beginning? So I would suggest that there is a, a real um, uh, meaning to the fall of man. There's a real meaning to the, you know, what seems more and more to me the legend or the, the myth of the Garden of Eden and eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, being kicked out of the garden, the temptation by the serpent, the fall of the watchers, you know. All of this, when I think of a spiritual existence, this, you know, I have to imagine that the spirit of love must have necessity uh, entail the spirit of all that is not love or the reality of all that is not love which of its own uh, nature contains the spirit of all that is not love, right? Envy, jealousy, strife, bickering, gossip, all these things is what I now consider the spirits. And you know, remember, Enoch talks of the Lord of spirits. Revelation talks about the seven spirits that go out into all the world from the throne of God. And so, if we can open our mind to the idea that that our scripture is the you know physical embodiment into form of something that exists beyond time and form in spirit, and that's why it's difficult to reconcile at times, and and we don't see an answer clearly. To the you know the reason God introduced sin and the devil you know the devil isn't existing in some other universe like the way we portray our space battles and some Klingon nation is coming with their spaceship to fight against another nation you know that that's a dualism that should be rejected from both a metaphysical standpoint and an eschatological standpoint the scriptures don't speak of a an equal or an otherness called the devil, an evil world, an evil country, an evil planet that's coming to fight against God and God's good side. No, God created Lucifer, the greatest of God's creations that fell. Where was the impetus for the fall? Where in God's world was an opening for Lucifer to fall? What crack existed in God's perfection? If not part of that perfection. And so I've come to the conclusion that only in the idea of love can we find um, a narrative in which sin and the devil and iniquity and all of that are part of the idea of love. They're not against it in the sense of trying to stop it being an alternative force. They are the other side of love that must be must exist for love to exist. And that's why it can all end at some point. Once love exists, once the memory of everything that is not love exists. See, that's why it says sin will never be spoken, of, it'll never be mentioned again. Not that it will not be remembered. Not that it will not have a an essence that that is the other side of love, but it'll never be mentioned again. It's got no more place in the, in the future existence. And in that idea, then, it, it brings me back to wondering about the death even of the, of the, uh, the, the unrighteous. You know, what could that mean in a story in which God provided the unrighteousness? God provided the mechanism by which man could fall. And love would seem... Uh, it, it wouldn't seem to serve the idea of love that to destroy these spirits forever in punishment that were simply the process of God's idea coming to be. And so I don't have the answers for these things. I just have the questions. 
about what might become of the of the dead. Enoch tells us in the beginning of all the places, all the abodes for the souls of the dead, even right down to the souls of non-believers. But they weren't so bad as to have their soul taken away. And so even in Enoch, there's this idea of souls taken away. That's very hard for me to reconcile. How do you take a soul away and how do you justify that? How do we claim this great God whose judgment is so righteous that we see throughout the whole scripture? God's judgment is is deemed as righteous and true and correct, which means that even someone like me that can't fathom God punishing someone forever who literally was at the at the losing end of God's own game plan. How am I going to praise God as His judgment being righteous forever if what I come out the other end and see is that, you know, some of my friends are being tortured forever in hell because they didn't believe in Jesus even though they were some of the most selfless, you know, decent people that I've known, as opposed to so many of the Christians that I've known that are some of the most selfish, backstabbing, gossiping, judgmental, hypocritical people that I've ever known. So they're going to be in eternal goodness and righteousness, but my friends who didn't know Jesus or were following some idol that helped them to learn to be selfless and decent in their life, they're going to burn in hell forever. Well, see, I can't see praising a God's judgment if that were the judgment. And because I'm assured in the Scripture that I will, in fact, praise His judgment, I have to imagine it's a different judgment than the one the Christians talk about. It's a different judgment even than the one that we perhaps mentalize when we read such words, even in Enoch, because Enoch certainly comes down hard on the on the sinner, doesn't he? On all the unrighteous and impious. He's ready to have them destroyed. And yet he's praising God's judgment. So I say there's a lot in that that we don't understand. And that's why we're told not to judge. We're told you just keep showing that love. You keep, you Christian that believes in Jesus, that follows Jesus because Jesus said, this is eternal life. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, if you want to be on God's good side, apparently what you want to do is give up this life. Not care about your own, you know, not be concerned for your own good. Not even be concerned for what you might eat or drink today. What you might wear, where you might sleep. But shift your concern to someone else. Be someone's servant. Not because it's going to score you points with God, but because, you know, the love that you need to find in your heart, that's where it's found. It's found in in the way that Jesus expressed the Spirit. And so that's what we're really, that's what I feel, you know, that's what I'm called to do, is to try and express the Spirit in that way as a servant. And only with love in my heart, is the whole circle complete. Only when I really love to do it. Not when I think it's my, you know, my duty that I'm going to be rewarded for. But only because I I find it's, I find God in my heart. And that by serving others, it brings a happiness and a joy and a light to me. That's the love where, you know, I believe we're all supposed to be searching for. And so uh, I'd like to leave it at that today with the 10 weeks because I don't want, I want everybody to reflect on that. The last part of Enoch, perhaps I'll let you read for yourself, uh, which is a sort of a catalog of what God's going to do to the sinners and hand them over to the righteous. And, you know, he's trying to extol his children, as he says in the very end of this as as we uh, began to read. Um, 
And now I tell you, my children, and show you the paths of righteousness and the paths of wrongdoing. And I will show you again so that you may know what is to come. And now listen, my children, walk in the paths of righteousness and do not walk in the paths of wrongdoing. For all those who walk in the paths of iniquity will be destroyed forever. And so this is the part, you know, I have trouble with in reconciling a this loving God whose judgment I'm going to praise forever. And so I say this is something for Christians to, you know, to really meditate on. However, we in our own uh, uh, mind find uh, this uh, interpretation. Perhaps we're someone that believes there's people out there, you know, Hitler or George Bush or Hillary Clinton, you know, should be destroyed forever. You know, I say that's a very dangerous feeling. I don't want to feel that way. You know, God told me to forgive everybody. God told me not to judge. You know, it's not, this is, that's why I keep trying to get in the head of Enoch. What's he saying to his children, except that to give them confidence, don't worry these people that are harming and killing and stealing and raping that's they're not going that that's going to be destroyed forever iniquity will be destroyed forever but of course he says those who walk will be destroyed forever so he's enoch seems to be speaking of the actual people being destroyed forever and i say that you know christians got to be very careful to take that as, well, God says, and so I'm happy to start pounding my fist and pointing at who's going to be destroyed forever. I mean, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to love those who persecute us, not point at them and say, you're going to be destroyed forever. There's no love there. So I say, here's the real dichotomy. Here's the paradox for a Christian. Yes, there's scripture that seems to point to an undoing of those who are not faithful, to a destruction of those who who perpetuate wrong. But at the same time, it's not for Christians to judge that action. And in addition to not judging it, it's for Christians to love those even that are, you know, perhaps especially that are those kind of people. And it's because it's in that love that those people are supposed to see God. But if Christians are judging them and not loving them, then the Christian's putting themselves on the wrong side, just like the person they're judging. And I think that's the most important lesson that I've gotten from Christian scripture, is that even though there's scripture that allows me to feel that my faith entitles me to a certain position with God, that my belief is beyond, above, superior to all the world who are unbelievers, I'm not to judge those unbelievers. I'm to love them with a Christ type of love that would reveal to them what God is. Not to judge them because I see them as non-believers. I see them as living without faith. I see them as wrongdoers. And therefore, I can say, God's going to destroy you. You know, I find this to be a very difficult part of Christianity. And and the part that it seems the whole teaching of Jesus is there to, to provide a path through by pointing out that we're simply to consider ourselves a servant. We're to love. We're to try and live a life detached from our material possessions, detached from the worldly measure of value, and attached to to, uh, a, a life emulating our master, who said, hey, look, I'm the master, and I'm down on my knees washing your feet, this is how I want you to treat each other. Not, not vying for who's number one. The greatest among you will be your servant. So 
You know, that is the message of Christianity, which is why I want to keep repeating, who really wants to be a Christian? Who wants to live a life of abandonment of this life for someone else, to be a servant for someone else, to take the jeers and the, and the persecution of non-believers in the dark and praise them, love them, serve them? You know, but that's what, you know, that's the only thing. That is what Christianity is. Everything else is a, is a lie. It's a, it's a profanity. And that's why it's, it's not producing the sort of fruit that, that, you know, I don't know, Jesus asked us to and Paul warned us about. That's why I think Christians should be on their guard of feeling too confident these days. You know, being thankful for being saved is one thing, but being aware of what following the Master is and what we were called to do and what it means to follow him. It isn't just for ourselves to be a, to be some sort of, oh, look at my sacrifice. That doesn't seem to get you anything as far as what Paul says. Paul says, if I give everything to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. If I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So Christianity is a very deep, profound realization of what the Spirit of God really is and, and, and a commitment to following that because you really believe it, that Jesus demonstrated it. And by being vindicated by God, rise, raising him from the dead, that's what proves to you and I, hey, he must have been right. Even though he lived poor, homeless, destitute, beaten up, jeered at, he must have been the, the right one because God raised him from the dead, not the Pharisees. So, you know, that's what I believe Christianity is supposed to teach us. Ultimately, if you, you know, Jesus is our example, following him is eternal life. This is the spirit of God. All the judgment that God is demonstrating, hey, all of those that don't follow this, they, they're not going to make it, or their works aren't going to make it, or that way isn't going to make it. That's all been declared. But it's not supposed to be the narrative of the followers of Christ to be declaring that. He never said, you go out now and warn everybody as I have, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to hell. That's all that matters anymore. So you're my spokespeople now. You go out and warn the world. That's not what he said. In fact, he said just the opposite. You go out and give yourself to this evil world so that they can see what God is. So anyway, guys, I know you, you know, those that listen to me know the story. I appreciate you putting up with with my uh, repeating it over and over, but I feel it's important enough for my own spirit to have to hear it over and over because I just want for me, me, me. And even though I believe in Jesus, believe God raised him from the dead, I have the hardest time believing that, that the greatest uh, among us is our servant. I mean, I believe it because that's what, Jesus said, I have a hard time following that line of thinking, and yet I know it must be the right one, and so I keep trying to motivate myself, inspire myself, and push myself to live that life and deny myself not just to win points with God, but to, to find that love in my heart that God says I need to have, that Paul declared that I'm nothing without, none of my faith does anything for me. If, if it isn't bringing the love in my heart, and, and we know what the love's going to do, it's going to let me lay my life down for a friend, turn my other cheek, not care whether I eat, but care more whether you eat today. My neighbor, does my neighbor have food? Is my neighbor okay? Why do I have a closet full of clothes and blankets and comfort, and there's other people on the street that don't? So... You know, I never want to present myself as following him, just as understanding what he said and, and 
believing that following him is the right thing and therefore you know whatever i can do to motivate myself that's what i'm doing and and if you know that's the nature of this bible study and if it's helping to motivate others then i'm i'm very grateful and, and you know i feel that's all i can that's all i can offer but i believe it's the most important thing we can get out of the teaching of jesus it's it's all this bible study is really about and so um you know, I, I hope that I share a little bit of that um, encouragement with you. That if we want eternal life, the thing to do is to sacrifice this life. Be, be able to find it in our hearts to love our neighbor enough, love, love God enough uh, to follow Him and give up this life, knowing we're not giving up this life, we're gaining everything that we could possibly gain in our spirit forever. Which is why it comes down to believing in forever. Which to me is why it comes down to having some sort of metaphysical understanding of what forever might be or how it might be so that we can believe it, so that we can act it out. We can act beyond this life. We can act beyond this temporal vision of comfort and value and on a supernatural level, as Paul said in Romans. You know, even though I I can't help but to live in this body and be a slave to sin, I can live in my mind, I can live in some dimension through my mind to God, and I can forever be renewing my mind so that every moment I can keep trying to find that love in me to be a servant. And even though I will fail over and over and over, that struggle in my mind and in my spirit to want that, to identify that as God, I believe that that's, you know, that's the best path we can be on. And so thanks to those that are um, studying with us. And thank you for the encouragement, especially Brother Dave that always writes and encourages me. It means an awful lot to me. And... Uh, for the rest of you, I just hope that you're you're learning something from this, and if it's bringing you any closer to the Spirit of God, <clears throat> excuse me, in your own heart, then uh, then I'm very satisfied that the ministry is um, you know is having an effect. So we'll talk to you next week. Thanks everybody for being here.